Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever uh, to you all uh, joining us for these tax uh, talks. As we will now call them, uh, we are resuming the webcast that we used to doing when we were developing the BEPS uh, action plan. We had a pause in the webcast, not in the work, unfortunately, because we've been extremely busy uh, as the international tax agenda is uh, still quite busy too. Uh, but we thought it would be important uh, to restore these ways of communication with all our stakeholders, whether you're from governments, from academics, from business, from the civil society. Uh, we think that these webcasts are the way to uh, feed you with the latest information in the most transparent uh, manner. Uh, I am uh, today with uh, two colleagues uh, to present uh, uh, you the update on the international tax agenda. You can see uh, the slides uh, giving you uh, our email <coughs> or our tweet if you want to ask questions. Uh, we have team assisting in the background, uh, and if there are questions coming in, we'll try to respond to them at the end of this webcast, which is planned to last one hour and no longer than one hour. Uh, but if we have uh, questions, of course, we'll try to answer them all. Today, um, I'm uh, with uh, Arim Pros, uh, you all know, who's in charge of international cooperation and administration and actually a significant chunk of the BEPS uh, work and of tax administration. Uh, he will drive you uh, through the uh, latest uh, update on the implementation of BEPS and in particular the mechanism for reviewing the minimum standards which have been adopted among the 15 actions. And I will also uh, be with uh, Ben Dickinson who's in charge of the program dealing with tax and development, and he will also update you on our engagement uh, with other international organizations, our friends from the IMF, from the World Bank, from the UN, and uh, from the regional tax organizations, ATAF, CREDAF, SIAT, and many others, as well as on our programs dedicated uh, to uh, assisting and helping developing countries to have their say on this international tax agenda. I will start uh, with um, uh, a broad update uh, on the on the agenda, <clears throat> which will be made of, of four parts, and the first is about the implementation of the BEPS project. You all know that the BEPS project was endorsed by the G20 finance ministers and the G20 leaders uh, in the fall of 2015. The OECD Council also endorsed the BEPS action plan, the 15 measures, and they all said now it's time to implement, and they are implementing. Some had doubts that we would deliver BEPS on time, we did, and some had doubts that countries would start implementing, and they were wrong because countries are implementing. First of all, and we often forget it when making the presentation, transfer pricing rules have been updated, and this is a change which is implemented de facto. This is a new agreed interpretation of Article 9 of the tax treaties, and this is used by both taxpayers, tax administrations, and in most cases by uh, uh, the tax judges as well. And you will have seen that uh, we have updated the transfer pricing guidelines. This uh, was released a few weeks ago on the 23rd of May. <clears throat> the countries have started the implementation themselves, country by country reporting. Arim will drive us through that, but big, big implementation, hybrid mismatches, preferential regimes being amended to be in line with the automatic exchange of tax rulings or the revised nexus approach for patent uh, boxes. <clears throat> you will have seen also that the European Union has been quite active in implementing across its membership, 28 uh, EU member states, uh, the uh, BEPS agreement. It started with uh, the automatic exchange of tax rulings. There was a directive, I think the fastest directive, at least in tax matters. They have also adopted a directive on country by country reporting. You may understand that uh, there is maybe more to come. There is a debate on the publicity, but for the time being, what is the positive law in the EU member countries is this directive, which is a, a pretty neat transposition of Action 13 agreement, almost word to word. And uh, finally, there is uh, ongoing discussion within the European Union on what they call the Anti-Tax Avoidance Directive, which includes three measures related to BEPS on hybrid mismatches on CFC legislation and <clears throat> also 
uh, on interest deductibility action two, action three, and action four of the BEPS action plan. Uh, there will be an ECOFIN meeting tomorrow where this text may this text this directive may be agreed or not to be seen uh, tomorrow. Beyond all that, we have also started the negotiation of the multilateral instrument which was provided for by Action 15, the idea being to incorporate in existing bilateral tax treaties the changes which uh, have been adopted in the BEPS Action Plan as regards the minimum standard against treaty shopping, Action 6, or the changes to the definition of the permanent establishment, Action 7, or some changes to tax treaties under Action 2, or possibly the improvement of mutual agreement procedures uh, under Action 14. So a uh, multilateral instrument ad hoc group has been put in place. Mike Williams from the UK is chairing that group, and that group has met a number of times and uh, is, is on time to deliver uh, this new instrument, which would amend automatically the bilateral tax treaty, subject to the ratification by the parliaments of the countries which will be party to that convention. We have 96 countries around the table, maybe more to come before the end, the finalization of the negotiation. Uh, we have uh, issued a, a paper for people to comment uh, on uh, this, we will have a public consultation on the 7th of July, and we are quite confident that uh, the text of this multilateral instrument will be adopted uh, before November, and it will then be open for signature, and we'll try to find a, a signing date or a date for the signing ceremony uh, before uh, the end of the first semester in, uh, uh, I mean, 2017 next year. If we have as many countries signing this instrument as we have negotiating it, this would cover more than 2,000 bilateral treaties, which I think is quite impressive. <clears throat> One of the big topics we are working on uh, currently is establishing an inclusive framework for BEPS implementation. You may remember that as soon as the package was adopted, the G20 leaders, all the ministers across the world said uh, we need to have this implemented as fast as possible and as consistently as possible. And as a result, the G20 mandated the OECD to establish an inclusive framework for BEPS implementation. After some reflection within the Committee on Fiscal Affairs at the OECD, which is the decision-making body, and together with G20 countries, which have been brought on an equal footing to the Committee on Fiscal Affairs to develop the BEPS project, the proposal which was made was to open up the Committee on Fiscal Affairs and all its subsidiary bodies to all interested and committed countries and jurisdictions. What does commitment mean? It means that these countries and jurisdictions are expected, if they want to join the framework, to commit to the consistent implementation of the BEPS package, the 15 measures, but in particular the four minimum standards. <clears throat> the level of commitment must be the same as the commitment of G20 and OECD countries. The members of this inclusive framework, so the members of the Committee of Fiscal Affairs and its subsidiary bodies, when we will be talking about uh, BEPS, uh, these uh, members will be on an equal footing in the decision-making of, of the OECD, which means that they will be able to block if they're not happy with the outcome, but they will have the responsibility to agree consensus so that we are able to develop standards and to do the review. Because the goal of the inclusive framework is to set up standards, and there are a few remaining standards to be developed. We'll come back to these, but on profit split, on comparability, on transfer pricing, maybe on the toolkits for the implementation of BEPS as regards developing countries, and maybe on the way forward there will be more standard setting to do. The review and the monitoring of the implementation of BEPS, the review is about the four minimum standards, Arim will come back to that. And finally, supporting the implementation, in particular with uh, OECD, G20 and non-OECD countries, in particular with non-OECD and non-G20 countries. We have eight toolkits to be developed very often together with uh, the other international organizations. Ben will tell you a word about the international organization platform that we are putting in place. And also, we will provide further guidance for the implementation of many of the actions and uh, 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 very soon on the country-by-country -country reporting. The first meeting of this inclusive framework, meaning the Committee on Fiscal Affairs, 
opened up to all these uh, interested and committed countries will be the week after next in Kyoto. This will be host. Uh, <coughs> this will be hosted by Japan, in particular the chair of the Committee on Fiscal Affairs, Masa Azakawa, uh, and uh, we expect to have a significant number of countries coming, either because they would have committed by then or because they intend to commit before year end. Uh, at this point in time, we may have more than 90, 90 countries coming at the table. We hope that this will be confirmed. And you can appreciate that in a very uh, short time frame, we've been able to mobilize a large number of countries because there is a lot of appetite and the need for developing countries to take advantage of this new framework. The second <clears throat> big part of the international tax agenda is about tax transparency. I'm not sure that anyone has escaped from the so-called Panama Papers, which have triggered a lot of political interest and technical work in this area. And as a result of all the uh, political outcry and, and attention to that, uh, we are now very happy that all the countries and, ju and the jurisdictions which had been asked back in 2014 to commit to implementing the Common Reporting Standard, which is the standard on automatic exchange of bank information or banking and financial information, all the countries and jurisdictions have now committed to implementing the Common Reporting Standard in 2017 or at the latest starting in 2018. There were five remaining jurisdictions which before the Panama Papers had not committed, Bahrain, Lebanon, Nauru, Panama and Vanuatu. They now have committed, which I think is good news. Uh, uh, the total number now amounts to 101 countries and jurisdictions. We have also made significant progress in moving towards the implementation of automatic exchange of information. You can see that the, mutual, the Multilateral Competent Authority Agreement, the MCAA, for the implementation of automatic exchange of uh, financial account information. Now we have 82 countries which have signed this MCAA. The most recent uh, countries having joined are the Russian Federation and Israel as, as the latest signatories. Be careful, sometimes there is a confusion between the MCAA for automatic exchange of information and the MCAA for country by country reporting exchange of information. Uh, these are two separate instruments. Uh, even though they both rely on the multilateral convention, which is the hard law uh, and, and primary law instrument uh, that now is covering a large uh, number of countries. You can see that on that slide. We now have 96 countries and jurisdictions which participate to this multilateral convention. Jamaica, Uruguay joined very recently. We have another four countries uh, in the pipe. Six have expressed interest in joining, now need to be scanned to see whether they can respect the confidentiality standards because there is a scan by the coordinating body of this convention for a country or a jurisdiction to be able to join. Uh, and uh, that means that this is getting, I mean, a very large, if not universal instrument. The Global Forum also is increasing. Lebanon and Paraguay are the latest members. Uh, we now have 134 countries and jurisdictions on an equal footing in the Global Forum. If we stay on the tax transparency for another minute, you will have seen that the G20, when they met in Washington in April, in response largely to the Panama Papers, mandated the OECD to establish a list of objective criteria to identify non-cooperative jurisdictions with respect to tax transparency. So objective criteria, which means that we'll have to identify how we can assess the compliance of a country under jurisdictions with the transparency standards. And there are not that many elements uh, out there. The assessment by the Global Forum, mm -hmm. signing multilateral convention, uh, moving towards automatic exchange of information. So we're working on these with OECD and G20 countries to be able to report to the G20 finance ministers at their meeting in Chengdu, which is in China on the 23rd and 20th. 24th of July. But the Global Forum and the FATF have also been mandated to work on how we could improve the effectiveness of the implementation of the standard on beneficial ownership. I think everybody agrees that the standard is good, the standard doesn't need to be revisited, but it is not properly implemented. 
we do think that the common reporting standard will be a way to improve the effectiveness of the implementation of the standard, but there, may, there is much more to do, maybe at some point to come to the solution of, of registries, public registries or not, but before that, we need to do all the analytical work and we'll work with the Global Forum, with the FADF to make proposals so that we move from good standards to good implementation. The Global Forum and FATF are due to deliver a report by October for another G20 finance ministers meeting. We've been active too, and I wanted just to touch upon that in, on the front of, of getting tax administrations working better together. As you know, we have the Forum on Tax Administration, which gathers all the OECD, the G20 countries uh, uh, tax commissioners. It's, it's a very uh, senior group because the tax commissioners come in person together with a team. Uh, we had a meeting in Beijing, uh, which went uh, extremely well at the end of May. And uh, we had uh, 44 tax commissioners present there. Uh, the agenda was about running a tax administration. I won't get into the details of these, but they also took stock of where we are on JITSIC collaboration to tackle the Panama Papers and how tax inspectors from the different countries can better work together to exchange uh, on real-time information on schemes and on some practices. And the tax commissioners also endorsed and agreed on the common transmission system, which will be the service that uh, will be developed uh, first, uh, built by the end of the year, and then implemented for the information under the common reporting standard, but also under country-by-country -country reporting exchange of information or tax ruling exchange of information, how we can format this information, encrypt it, and make sure that it moves from one tax administration to another one. Last word, which is not on the slide, I was very interested in seeing all the tax commissioners from OECD countries, G20 countries, putting the emphasis on the need to eliminate double taxation, meaning that they want to use the instrument to exchange information to fight evasion, they want to use the BEPS instruments to fight avoidance, but they're also very keen on eliminating double taxation by better dispute resolution mechanisms. Arim will drive you through the progress we're making on Action 14, but this was one of the top topics from all tax commissioners, meaning that there is clearly a change of the mindset uh, of the tax commission in this area who are now paying more attention to this quite critical issue. Last bit of the, uh, the update on the international tax agenda, which is not tax legislation or tax lawyer type of work, but tax policy and tax economies type of work. Uh, we have been mandated by the G20 presidency, China, and the incoming G20 presidency, Germany, to uh, prepare what they call a G20 tax policy symposium, uh, which will gather ministers and finance ministers and central bank governors uh, in the morning, which will precede the uh, G20 finance ministers meeting in Chengdu. So on the morning of the 23rd of July, uh, G20 finance ministers and central bank governors will be discussing a tax policy agenda with two main sessions, one which will be about uh, uh, how do we reconcile all the good recommendations we've made to promote growth, innovation-driven growth on the one hand, and all the good recommendations we've made to reduce inequalities through tax policy. The slight problem we may have is that these recommendations, as good as they are, may not always be compatible or consistent. So the idea is to see how we can, at the global level and with the support of the G20, move into better advice in this very important area, what the world needs currently are jobs, employment, investment, trade, tax policies can play a critical role there, but we also need to reduce inequality and square that circle. We'll try to have the views of the different ministers and maybe start work probably with the uh, support of, of the IMF, uh, which is doing great work in this area. And the second aspect of it, which is more for the tax lawyers uh, who are very keen on, on seeing uh, double taxation being tackled by the right instruments, we will have a session 
on how we can improve tax certainty, which relates to international tax standard, which relates to sound and stable tax policies in countries, which also relates to the practices of tax administrations, and which drives us back to Action 14 and the need to properly eliminate double taxation through better instruments like uh, mutual agreement procedures or arbitration. I should have mentioned that the multilateral instrument that we are developing will include a provision dealing with arbitration. So that's where uh, we are uh, today in terms of uh, implementation, in terms of, of moving the agenda forward, in terms of being more inclusive, and in particular with many developing countries joining the decision-making bodies of the OECD on an equal footing, we will have major opportunities to be able to develop global standards, which will be to the benefit of countries and companies as well, uh, but also many challenges. How do we make sure that all these countries and jurisdictions can work well together, that they can improve the situation? We strongly believe here in tax cooperation, bringing all the people together, I think, is the first step to get uh, better tax administration, better service to taxpayers, better service to governments, to better collect revenue. So these are the challenges, the challenges ahead of us. Now I will turn to Arim, who will drive you through the implementation of the BEPS package. Thank you, Pascal. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all of you. As Pascal has said, I'm going to walk you through a little bit through where we are um, on the BEPS package, looking at questions of how the review process is going to work, how it's different, monitoring versus peer review, and then give you a rough sense of where we are um, on the implementation, uh, both at the OECD, but also at the EU and at the country level, as much as we can do this, and then finish off with a little bit of a focus on um, action, I guess, 13 and also action 14. Uh, and I'm going to do this uh, quick, um, hopefully, so there's also time for questions um, at the end. Um, the first bit that I want to explain, just take a little time to explain the peer review as opposed to, as opposed to monitoring and what peer review actually means. Um, so what you see here on this first slide is the question, what is BEPS peer review? Um, the first point to note here is that the peer review itself will apply to the four minimum standards. And then, as you'll see on the next slide, with respect to the other action of the BEPS package, we're going to have a process of monitoring. And they're distinctly different. The peer review process is a process that we in the OECD and also in the Global Forum have used. And while some people think it might not be a tremendously effective process, we have very positive experience with the impact and the change that a peer review process, well um, thought through and implemented, uh, can achieve. Uh, we have done this for a number of years now in the area of the Global Forum, where we do this for information upon request, and in the future, we will do it for automatic exchange of information. And if you look at the experiences that we've had on the Global Forum for information request, you see that it really drives change. It's a key piece of ensuring the level playing field, that we know that if you move as a country, you will not be only one moving, and there is a competitive disadvantage by you moving to those minimum standards, to which all countries have agreed, but this ensures that as you're moving, you know that your peers are also moving and your peers are seeing what you do and you can see what the peers are doing. So that's just, I guess, a brief word on the peer review process. It will apply to the minimum standards. There are four minimum standards. I'm going to take you through a fancy slide that shows the minimum standards and moves them around. So that's what we learned from the digital economy, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, but, but it is important then also that you have a very structured and a clear peer review. What does that mean? It means that you need to have terms of reference. We all agree the basis on which we will conduct the peer review and then a methodology. Then what's a methodology? It's when you do it, how you do it, how it's done, when you look at it, the scheduling, the timing, the lengths, the in-depth. There is a lot of questions that sound very detailed but are very important in designing a process that actually delivers. And then speaking about delivering, and that's the last point on the slide, we will deliver public reporting. So this is not some black box operation where we sit around a table in smoke-filled rooms and come to conclusions. Um, the reports and the outputs, as has been the case in the other peer review processes, will be public. That's true for the Global Forum, but also true more globally, whether that's in the area of corruption, where the 
OECD is very active, or in other areas where we use this model of making sure we all move together on a level playing field with everybody, as Pascal has said, having a voice and an equal seat at the table as this moves forward, all of those joining the inclusive framework. So I think that's uh, the first part. And then let me move to the monitoring. So with respect to the other actions that are not minimum standard, what are we going to do? We're going to gather data on the implementation of the other elements of the BEPS package. And in some sense, if you think about an example, this is also very necessary sometimes for the very operation of the rules. So you take hybrid mismatches as an example, as you know, without going into details, there's a primary and a secondary rule. So as countries implement, they also need to know when, how other countries have implemented because your rules in your country will to some degree depend on connect with the rules in the other country. So that's an information gathering exercise that allows us to monitor as we move forward also on the other actions. Very importantly, and that's the second bullet point, we have an action 11 that gathers data and has gathered data on BEPS, but also the measures to counter BEPS. So we can see how over time we're doing and gather data on that. And that, I think, is a, is a key part of the monitoring process. And last, because we've received this question repeatedly, yes, there will be a continuation also of the task force on the digital economy. And that's action one. If I then give you an illustration a bit on a slide first of the overview of the BEPS actions and then talk you through a little bit the monitoring and the peer review that I just mentioned, then you can look at this slide and you see the BEPS actions grouped under the overall themes. There's a theme of coherence, there's a theme of substance, and there's a theme of transparency, and we have structured and showing you the action by theme just to get you a sense. And then magically, and I'm not sure it works, but if it does work, you will now see how we can reorder uh, those actions to have them under the different categories. As not every action is created equal, um, you see that there is four minimum standards. That is action five, action six, action 13, or more specifically, the country by country reporting part of action 13 that also has other transfer pricing documentation in it. And then, as Pascal has already mentioned, action 14. So these are the four minimum standards. Then we have reinforced international standards. We have common approaches um, that is uh, neutralizing hybrid mismatch arrangements and um, also limiting interest deductibility. And then best practices, action 3 and action 12. And we have a number of analytical reports and measuring BEPs. So if you look at these, we will, on the minimum standards, have a peer review process, and for the rest, we are going to have a monitoring process. If we speak about implementation just for a moment and give you a sense before turning back uh, to the, uh, the peer review aspects on the specific actions, you see tremendous action bearing in mind also that the package as such was only endorsed, I say, six months ago, not quite true, but very, very recently. We see changes on action five, where countries are taking actions, they are changing their legislation as it applies to their IP regimes. Uh, we have seen uh, action at the level of the uh, EU, where a directive has already been agreed on the automatic exchange of rulings. You will recall that Action 5 has two essential components. One is around structuring IP regimes that are consistent with the substance requirement of BEPS. And the second one is an enhanced transparency feature in particular with respect to the spontaneous or automatic exchange of certain tax rulings. Europe has acted here already in a directive. Um, and also the parallel work in the EU, the Code of Conduct, uses exactly the same framework so we can assure that internationally and within the EU we're moving forward on a consistent basis. So a lot of changes in legislation around the world where people are amending uh, their laws to bring them into line with the Nexus approach for IP regimes. Some countries have already abolished their IP regimes, so there is tremendous amount of progress. Um, if we look at action six, that will be taken up largely in the multilateral instrument, action 15. So that's where this is going to come in. Action 13 and action 14, I'm going to talk about in a little while in, in somewhat more detail. 
Then moving over, looking at implementation, Action 7, again, something to be included in the multilateral instrument. Importantly, Action 810, Pascal has already mentioned the decision of council, so this has come out in, in the end of May. Action 2, uh, countries are introducing rules, um, as Pascal has mentioned. It's also part of uh, the European directive that is currently under discussion. The same is true for Action 3, the same is true for Action 4. Action 12, a number of countries have these rules already, a number of others are thinking of introducing them. So you see uh, there, is, there is big movement on all of these actions. Uh, let me then move on perhaps to the next slide, as I said, with a focus on first action 13, and then the next slide, a word, and that will be my last slide, on action 14. Action 13. First of all, to recall what is action 13. Action 13 has three aspects, a local file, a master file, and a CBC reporting. When we talk about the minimum standard, we talk about the country-by-country -country reporting part. And there we have come up with a complete implementation package to make it easy to introduce. And that is something to recall where the primary measure is that the multinational enterprise files one country by country report covering all its operation in the country in which it is established. And then it goes to the tax administration of that country, which then uses its treaty network, including the multilateral convention and primarily the multilateral convention, to exchange this information with the tax authorities uh, of the country that are identified in the CBC file that the ME has operations. So this is the mechanism that we have put in place. To facilitate the exchange part of that, as Pascal has mentioned, um, that is done through a multilateral competent authority agreement, or more specifically can be done through a multilateral competent authority agreement that by now 39 jurisdictions have signed. And we expect uh, more jurisdictions to sign shortly. We'll have a signing ceremony in the margins of the inclusive framework meeting in Kyoto. So that number is likely to increase. That multilateral competent authority agreement sits on the basis of Article 6 of the multilateral convention, which allows one or more parties to come together to exchange information automatically. This is the model that we're using for country by country reporting. And as Pascal explained, it's also the model that we're using for exchanges relating to the common reporting standard for financial accounts. Um, this information goes to the tax administration. This is not public. It is covered by the treaties and it goes to the tax administration pursuant to the instruments that are in place. There is a separate discussion within Europe on potential public country by country. But this, to repeat, is information that goes to the tax administration subject to the treaty confidentiality and appropriate use restrictions that we have introduced in the instruments. Also, on a practical level, um, as Pascal has mentioned, we are developing a common transmission system because it's nice to sign these agreements. At the end of the day, the information also needs to be physically delivered. And so we are in the process of developing a transmission system. Um, it's a transmission system that will create bilateral connections between the tax administrations. So it's a bilateral system, but it's standardized, and it avoids the need for every single country to have a secure channel of exchange with every other country that, if you put the numbers together, could easily end up with thousands of different relationships that would have to be established without a standardized process of moving this forward. Um, as you can see on the box on the right-hand side, given when we approve the package, there's tremendous progress already in countries either having already legislated or having publicly announced the legislation being in the draft stages. So currently, if you count, we're at 48. And of course, the EU already has approved a directive that implements the country-by-country -country exchange of information um, of CBC to tax administrations, I think it was in March. So countries are moving quickly ahead. Maybe two last points on action 13, the country by country reporting. One, 
um, if we feel that there is a need to issue further more detailed guidance on the meaning operation of CBC Action 13, then we will proceed to do that. Very similar to what we're doing on the common reporting standard, where if you are working in this area, you're aware that we've issued a handbook. We have frequently asked questions and answers. So we try to be receptive. So what we have is a system uh, that is consistent, that also reduces compliance costs for businesses and standardizes across the wide membership of the inclusive framework as much as we can do this. And last, we have ongoing work on Action 13 within the Forum on Tax Administration, which brings together the tax commissioner, the tax administrations really, to ensure that when this information comes in, they have processes and procedures for the effective use of this information, but of course also of the appropriate use of information. You will recall that this is intended for high-level risk assessment and other BEPS risk, but only. And so we're working with tax administrations that they can make effective use of this information, but also within the, the, the confines of the agreement to make sure it's appropriately used. And then let me move to the the last slide, which is Action 14, tremendously important, and one of the minimum standards, one of the four minimum standards, in fact. Um, this is under the transparency and the certainty part, to ensure uh, that we have equal focus on the avoidance of non-taxation, but also the avoidance of double taxation. Always been a remit of the OECD, continues uh, to be the remit for the OECD. Um, the, the point here to make is there is two pieces in Action 14. There is a number of countries um, that have committed for mandatory binding arbitration, 20 countries. I think that's not the end, um, but so far 20 countries. That is not insignificant. You can think, well, it's only 20 countries, but it does cover 90% of the map cases that we're currently covering our statistics. And uh, the first one to admit that we're not covering all the map cases in the world, but just the sub-segment. But just to make the point that there's a significant commitment of a significant number of countries that cover a very significant percentage of the map problems that we have today. The part that everybody has committed to is the minimum standards and the peer review of that. Uh, we are on schedule, the reviews are expected and will begin in 2016. That is in the mandate of the endorsed Action 14 report and we will have first reports in 2017. I come back to the point that I made at the beginning. It is a peer review process. Peer review processes, we have the experience, can be a significant instrument for change, and we expect that here also to be the case. As somebody has said, what gets measured gets done, and that's important to see that this is a meaningful process where we will be moving forward. It's what every OECD and every G20 country has committed to, um, so we will be delivering this. And then, of course, I should also mention that uh, jumping back to binding arbitration, there will also be a provision on arbitration in the multilateral instrument. And this fits into the overall OECD agenda of dispute resolution that is, of course, focusing on MAP, but it's also focusing on arbitration, but also it's focusing on things that avoid disputes from arising, whether it's cooperative compliance relationship, whether it's more APA, joint audits. There's a whole suite of things that we at OECD feel strongly uh, we need to advance with the focus here, as I said, on the BEPS Action 14, on MAP on the one hand and arbitration on the other. And with this, I give it to Ben, I think. Thanks very much and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is the final presentation, and I'm just going to touch on some of the projects that we've been working on to help developing countries with their domestic resource mobilisation efforts. So, first of all, the, the platform for collaboration on taxation. Uh, by way of background to this point, it's important to note that in recent years, strengthening tax systems in developing countries has emerged as a key priority and is now a component of the Sustainable Development Goals, which were agreed at the UN in 2015. Now, the international organisations already provide significant support to developing countries, but if developing countries are going to meet the Sustainable Development Goals, the, they are going to need to raise taxes uh, by significant amounts in a fair and efficient way. And the IMF, the OECD, the UN and the World Bank 
see deepening their collaboration and cooperation as an essential component of strengthening these tax systems. And that is why uh, in April we announced details of the platform for collaboration on taxation. The concept uh, is available online. And this is our new joint effort to intensify our cooperation with our partners on tax issues uh, in the interests of developing countries in particular. So the platform will formalise uh, regular discussions between the four major players uh, on the design and implementation of standards for international taxation and work on a range of other things. So what will it actually uh, do? Well, we will uh, strengthen our capacity building support, we'll deliver joint products and work, and we'll share information on operational and knowledge activities. We will focus um, on many international tax matters, which I'll say uh, a bit more about in a, in a moment, but we will also cover other issues that are of high priority to developing countries. So, for example, in the next couple of years, we will address the informal sector, and we will take uh, account of the different comparative advantages of each of the players as we go along. We will hold regular meetings with developing countries and our key partners in this endeavour will also be regional tax organisations who are already uh, major players in their regions and we will consult business and civil society uh, as and when uh, we think it, we need to. So one of the, uh, the first uh, products that we have to deliver um, is about capacity building and technical assistance and we are responding to a mandate from G20 finance ministers. Now work is at an early stage but I can just say uh, a couple of words about some of our early findings. Uh, we believe that the international development community and those who are uh, helping uh, developing countries need to mobilise much more coherently around government plans for raising revenues. Secondly, there needs to be much better uh, coordination and cooperation amongst providers of assistance, particularly at the country level. So then they need to come together to share information and to cooperate much more effectively. Concerning international tax, we believe that a new uh, way of looking at tax diagnostics is required that would bring together a tool on cross-border issues in taxation covering avoidance, uh, tax evasion, exchange of information issues and some of the tax and crime uh, issues. And finally, we will be reviewing the range of recent initiatives designed to support domestic resource mobilisation, of which there are several, and this will include our Tax Inspectors Without Borders project, which we were very pleased to launch with the UNDP last year. And I'm pleased to report that results to date uh, include over $250 million of additional res revenues raised as a direct result of the projects. And the projects uh, include um, work in Senegal, Ghana, Kenya and Zimbabwe, just to name a few. So the second major undertaking that we're uh, embarking on is to deliver a number of toolkits. Now these are designed to help developing countries implement the measures developed under the BEPS project and to uh, address other related international tax matters. And the point about these is that they're designed to translate some of the complexity of the BEPS outcomes into simplified approaches for developing countries. Now, I won't go into the details, but you can see them on the, on the screen. The first of these uh, has already been delivered on tax incentives, uh, and that was done last November. And this addresses the well-known problem that tax incentives, for example, tax holidays, don't always deliver the investment anticipated. The toolkits will uh, have a link to the BEPS implementation framework that uh, Pascal has already outlined and participants in the inclusive framework will no doubt want to shape and feed in and advise on the production of the toolkits. 
Seven other toolkits will follow in the next uh, two to three years, covering a range of treaty and transfer pricing issues that developing countries have told us matter greatly to them. And this year, we are currently focused on the toolkits concerning the indirect transfer of interest, and the OECD is working on that with the IMF, and on a major piece of work on transfer pricing comparability, which developing countries say is their top priority, and we're doing that one with the World Bank. Now, discussion drafts will be uh, issued later in this year, which uh, you will be able to feed into. So I think that concludes the presentations, and I'm now going to hand back to Pascal. Thank you. Thank you. We'll focus for just a few minutes on what's next. And you have here on the slide the list of the next event, Kyoto meeting, uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, for a whole week and two days of the Committee on Fiscal Affairs on the one hand. Uh, more OECD tax talks uh, that will be after Kyoto and probably before Chengdu. Uh, Chengdu being the G20 finance ministers meeting where the G20 tax policy symposium will take place. And you can see that uh, we have thought of you for some uh, uh, homework. Uh, the homework is to comment uh, on the uh, discussion draft related to the multilateral instrument. We have not disclosed the text of the agreement as it's not practice, uh, usual practice, not practice at all by the governments to share the draft of their tax treaties. Uh, but we have listed all the relevant questions on which we would like to have some input, including on arbitration. Uh, we have also, or we will soon be issuing discussion drafts on uh, action two, action four, uh, and uh, more to come on 7, 8 to 10 on profit split and profit attribution. Uh, we are on time, but we are not speeding up because we don't want to preempt the participation of new countries in the inclusive framework. So I think it's extremely important to respect the deadlines, uh, but in a relaxed manner to the extent that uh, we need to have more views on documents, in particular as regards the standard uh, setting exercise. So that's uh, where we are today. And uh, you see that we are still very busy before the summer. Uh, July will be extremely active. And on the way forward, we'll have to see how we organize our methods of work to make sure that the participation of new countries is meaningful and not for them to sit at the table and try to cope with what's going on, but rather being able to shape the debate to input usefully and uh, to uh, make sure that we have a global standard and a global implementation. Global issues require global solutions, and that's where we're trying to uh, uh, head. Um, I would like now to turn quickly in the remaining five to ten minutes, uh, we'll be slightly ahead of schedule, on a few questions we have received. The first question we have received is on the uh, transparency front. We're asked whether there will be a peer review of the implementation of the common reporting standard. And the answer is quite plain and, stri and straight, it's yes. There will be a peer review, and actually it has already, already started. The Global Forum has an automatic exchange of information group, and this group is doing review, is reviewing the way countries implement through what we call a staged approach. Of course, at the end of the day, meaning after 2018, when all the countries implement, we'll be able to do the usual type of review, going through the legal framework to the practical implementation and testing whether all the information is collected, which drives us back to the issue of beneficial ownership. So we are engineering this uh, review that will come at the end of the day. But before getting there, and instead of waiting for countries to do the job, we help countries do the job. We help countries negotiate agreements, signing the multilateral convention, checking that this is happening. I recently read that this would be an unfinished job to get countries uh, signing and nominating others in terms of uh, designating with which other countries, with which other countries uh, they will exchange information. It's not unfinished, it's en cours. And as you may know, if you read all the documents carefully, uh, over the summer, the countries will be invited to nominate the partners with which they intend to exchange information, and we will publicly communicate 
on how we match these uh, uh, nominations probably early in September. We're working on this and we'll be able much before the entry into force of automatic exchange of information to give the broad picture of who is doing what with whom, which is a key piece of information for all stakeholders. So that's what we're doing through the staged approach, uh, monitoring what countries are doing in terms of legislation, monitoring what countries are doing in terms of exchange of information agreements, building the IT system and designating a service provider to make sure that the operations are run properly, and designing the very complex and challenging peer review mechanism which will have to start as soon as automatic exchange of information has started. So we need to turn this political agreement, breakthrough agreement, into a technical and practical reality. It is happening and we're supporting the member countries on that front. We have another question which is related to the work on beneficial ownership and I would like to turn to Arim to get his answer. Arim. Thanks, Pascal. The, the question is, uh, you mentioned, you being Pascal, <laughs> beneficial ownership. Do you think due diligence and know your customer requirements should be more detailed or additional requirements? It, it, it's stepping back a little to not jump to the answer. I think what we're seeing in this space is an increasing um, cooperation, if you wish, or a coming together of, on the one hand, the tax community, on the other hand, I guess, also the, the anti-corruption community and, and the, the money laundering or the anti-money laundering community. In fact, I just spoke at an anti-corruption event about an hour ago where there was significant interest on the question of beneficial ownership because it raises so many aspects of, if you wish, illicit behavior, whether it's tax evasion, uh, whether it's corruption, whether it's money laundering, it sort of comes together here and very often for all of these purposes, uh, structures are being used to hide the beneficial, the true beneficial owners of, of assets or income. So it's really a whole of government uh, topic here. I think it's also fair to say that if you look at the tax world with, and we've mentioned automatic exchange a couple of times, that the Common Reporting Standard or, or FATCA uh, does build extensively on existing FATF rules, logically also to minimize compliance costs on financial institutions that already undertake these AML processes. And in doing this, yes, the tax community has already added certain features, such as the tax residence, for instance, which isn't relevant for AML, but it's tremendously relevant for tax. Um, so as to whether we would suggest new requirements, I think it's a, it's a bit early here. I think there is themes, as I said, a theme of closer cooperation between this different constituency, I think domestically, but also internationally. Um, there is work to be done, certainly, on improving the implementation of the standard, not so much changing the standard, but the implementation of the standard, uh, of the FATF standard, um, on availability of the information, but not just that the information is there, but it's actually timely, that it's accurate, there's a lot of work, and it's also in this context, I think, that, that there is a mandate by the G20 to the Global Forum and the FATF uh, to come up with initial proposals, I think by October, on, on how the implementation can be approved of that, but it's a very active one. We'll, we'll have to see uh, what these implementation uh, proposals will, will do, but certainly it's a very active uh, topic on high on the political agenda. The other question we received is on action one, uh, which relates to the digital economy. As Arim indicated in his presentation, the task force on the digital economy will continue its work. The question is about unilateral actions taken here and there. Uh, uh, around uh, taxing the flows of, of related to the digital economy, and people wondered whether this is compatible with the BEPS approach. I must say that uh, Action 1 delivered a very interesting and useful report to the extent that it identified the sources of BEPS uh, resulting from the digitization of the economy. We prefer talking about that rather than the digital economy per se. Um, uh, however, uh, Action 1 report did not provide answers to the bigger issue of how do you tax the flows where you have a digital presence without a physical presence, which may drive uh, uh, people to the question of 
source and residence, how much of the market economy can have the right to tax the service provided on the market rather than the country where the intangible property or the services are actually located, those which will provide the services. Um, it was inconclusive. There were options explored, but none of them was consensual. And that's why we shouldn't be surprised that some countries take unilateral action uh, in this area. So what we hope is that the task force on the digital economy will be able to explore this further and to provide concrete solutions which hopefully will be consensual so that we move away from unilateral action. I think it's a good illustration of what happens where multilaterally we're not able to reach a conclusion. Uh, it was not easy and that's why we're not able to reach a conclusion, but uh, we should therefore uh, not complain too much about countries taking unilateral actions, even though that's not what we at the OECD uh, favor. The task force on the digital economy will continue the work and this work will fit the overall, overall horizontal project uh, conducted by colleagues at the OECD on rethinking the state of play and the challenges of the digitization of the economy, not only from a tax perspective, but from many, many other aspects. So I think we'll be able to have a nice understanding and uh, these two work streams uh, will, will feed each other, which I think will be pretty useful. I think we're coming to an end because we stopped having questions to the extent that most of you who are now replaying us uh, can see us, but uh, when it was live, it seems that we had too much demand uh, for our ability to deliver. So uh, too many people joining the webcast killed the webcast live, but you can replay it. Uh, this will come, this has come. If you can hear me now, it means that uh, uh, you will have been able to replay it. So apologies for this. We'll try to do uh, better next time. We hope that you will be even more numerous joining us without any technical problem. Uh, we promise that we'll do this on a regular basis. Next one will be in July, uh, before the G20 finance ministers meeting in Chengdu. And then, à la rentrée, as we say in French, uh, starting September, we'll do uh, tax talks regularly, probably one every six weeks or two months, so that we spread the news, we share the information, and we provide you with an even better service than today without technical problems. I would like to thank uh, Arim, to thank Ben, to thank the whole team which has prepared uh, these uh, tax talks. And uh, I would like to thank you all for uh, having tried to join live and for uh, replaying it uh, now. Thank you very much and uh, uh, see you or you see us uh, in July. Thank you. <laughs>